Hey ladies, got a struggle? Need to vent? It's time to join your voice and get down to business with some critical thought where like-minded ladies share their personal experiences to empower each other using critical thinking to make wise decisions. And now, here's your host, Lady C. Hi, this is Lady C, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Struggles of Jehovah's Witness Women. Our guest today has a very interesting story to tell because she is the child of a controlling Jehovah's Witness grandparent. And everyone knows that when you're in the organization, it's just hard following the rules of the organization, let alone when you're dealing with someone that takes the standards a little higher than what the Watchtower has prescribed. It makes it very difficult for her to enjoy life or even breathe. So today's guest is going to share what it's like to have not only a parent, but a grandparent that is controlling her every move. Please join me in welcoming Angel Newman to our program. Angel, welcome to our show. Hi, Lady C. Thanks for having me. I'm very, very appreciative that I'm able to tell, you know, a a story that I have gone through growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. And tell me, how did you and your family come to be part of this religious organization? Um, Well, it started back in the 70s um, when my grandmother had first joined. She had um, some Jehovah's Witnesses that came to preach to her home, and that's basically once she got involved in it. And after a few years of, you know, having the Bible studies with the Jehovah's Witnesses, she ended up getting baptized, and that's just when, like, you know, she started having her family of her own, and she started bringing her family into the organization. Okay. And basically— Did both your grandparents accept this religion together, or was it just your grandmother? Well, it started off with my grandmother, and she had already had um, all four of her children, which is my mother, my aunt, and my two uncles. And she was uh, currently married to um, to someone who wasn't in uh, who wasn't in the organization. And they, you know, she ended up convincing him, and they joined the organization together. Okay. Okay. And so then how did your mother, did your mother ever talk about growing, well, she was not, she did not grow up in the organization, but was she um, a minor child at the time that your grandmother became a witness? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all, all of my, my, my mother and her sister and her two brothers, they were all, you know, young teenagers when they had first gotten introduced into the organization. They were all young kids. They basically, you know, were introduced to it. And because they were very, very young, you know, my, both my uncles were, you know, they were kids. I would say that maybe six, seven years old, because my, my mother is the oldest child. And then my aunt was just a couple years younger than my mother. So them being the oldest, you know, they were, they were able to understand it a bit more. But unfortunately for my uncles, you know, they didn't really know what it was. And they all basically just grew up with it. Who is left out of the siblings of your mother that's serving in this religion today? It's my mother and my grandmother and my grandfather and my aunt. Okay, so your two uncles decided they didn't want the religion? Yeah, one of my uncles did get baptized, but um, as he he got baptized when he was 16. And as he grew older, he began to see that the religion was not for him, and he eventually disassociated himself. My other uncle, he um, never got baptized, but he was very active in the Kingdom Hall. And when he was 13 years old, because we did grow up in a very rough neighborhood, he eventually just strayed away and started, you know, getting into a lot of trouble. I'm just going to say it like that. You know, he, he had a hard life as well, so he just strayed away from the very beginning. When your uncle got in trouble... How did that affect your grandmother? It affected her very, very much in a very negative way because no mother wants to see their child getting into trouble with the law. You know, she tries her best to help him out because that's her son, but it takes a huge toll on her. So remember what we talked about in our earlier conversation about how strict your grandmother is and how rough it was just growing up in your family? Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about that she's being really controlling on your behalf because of what happened to her son? I did understand to a certain extent that maybe she was being controlling because of what was going on with my uncle. But at the same time, it just, 
it still bothered me a lot because she never even gave me a chance at all to show her that I'm not like him. You know, she started becoming very controlling at a very, very, very young age. I was in maybe a fifth or sixth grade when she began to become very controlling with me. And I wasn't allowed to have any friends. I wasn't allowed to associate with anybody. It was basically to school and back. You know, she would just automatically assume that I was going to turn out like him. So she just wanted to start controlling me from the very beginning. Yeah. And and I think that's the sad thing about it. And this is a pattern in the organization. Whenever someone in the organization does something wrong, the first thing that the society wants to do is assume that all other Jehovah's Witnesses will do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so what they'll do is they'll make hard, fast rules for everyone in the organization based on some experience that happened to one or two people in the organization. And mm-hmm. that's why it's such a controlling organization. So you ended up under a double system. You had the system of Watchtower, how controlling they are, and then your grandmother and how controlling she was based on Mm -hmm. the actions of your uncle. And that's what made your life so miserable because she couldn't see that people are individuals. And that's the problem that people have in the organization is treat me like an individual and not like a person that you had an experience with or a bad experience Mm -hmm. with, you know. Yeah. So what was she like at the Kingdom Hall? Because I remember we talked about, you know, you said she was one way, you know. It, it was like we were living a double life because when we were in the Kingdom Hall, she was this sweet, you know, soft-spoken, caring woman that everybody thought was like this, you know, the angel of the world. And when we were at home, it was a completely different story. She, you know, she was very abusive verbally, emotionally, and mentally. You know, she would always break me down and basically you know, make me feel like I was nothing. Like if I was a piece of crap, I would never amount to anything or be worth anything. And she would, you know, basically like, I I used to joke around with her and would tell her, why don't you just, you know, run by the police station and get like an ankle bracelet or something and keep me locked up in the house because, you know, you basically do that anyway. That's the only thing that you have left to do. She would not let me breathe without her say so, but she would do it in a very, very mean and evil way. And don't get me wrong. I love my grandmother dearly, but because of how she was at home, that was something that made me, that was one of the aspects that made me stray away from the organization because, you know, when she was in the kingdom hall, she was very, very sweet. Everybody thought that she could never do no wrong. And then when we were back at home, it was a completely different story. She was the complete opposite of that. And, you know, that that would make me sit down and think to myself, like, how can you be a person of God and say that you love God? And when you're in the kingdom hall, you know, you make it seem like you're this, you know, like, like a mirror of God, so to say. But then when you're at home, you're this mean and evil person that, you know, a, a joke Jehovah's Witness should not be acting that way. And Mm -hmm. nobody knew what she was like at home. And whenever I would try to tell, I I would try to tell elders, you know, I would try to tell people in the congregation, but, you know, no one really helped. No one was there for me or my mother. She was very controlling with my mother as well. And she basically, you know, to this day, she controls my mother to the fullest. Like my poor mother doesn't even know how to pay a bill or even use a computer or anything like that, because my grandmother has controlled her her entire life. You know, she's basically had taken care of her her entire life to the point where my mother cannot do anything for herself. And she basically tried to do the same thing with me. And I love my mother, but I saw what was happening with her, and I was like, I I don't want myself to end up that way. Now, is your grandmother pioneering or anything? Oh, no. She doesn't do any anything like that. She has a lot of health problems going on right now, so she does go out into field service every now and then with my mother. But the only thing she does is she just goes to the Kingdom Hall and she participates in the Watchtower and, you know, things of that sort. Now, what was it like for you in school? It was miserable, not only because I went to a school that was in a rough neighborhood, but... Because I did end up making, like, a couple of really, really good friends that I'm actually still friends with to this day. Like, very, very good friends. And But just unfortunately at the time, because I came from a Jehovah's Witness family and those kids were considered worldly and they were considered, you know, my grandmother used to call them demons, she would basically make life for me a living hell while I was in high school. I remember when they would have their parent-teacher conferences and uh, my grandmother would come with my mother and I used to dread it because my mother, she's very, very sweet. Like, you know, everybody loves my mom. She is the sweetest lady you will ever meet. 
But when she would bring my grandmother with her to parent teacher conference, I used to dread it. Whenever she would come, she had just this evil, evil look in her face. And she would be very, very mean to everybody that would come around her. And I remember having my friends back in high school, if they even looked at me or even said hi from a distance, even waved their hands from a distance to say hello to me, she would look at me as if I was creating the biggest sin in the entire world. You know, I was not allowed to even look at them or even speak to them if she was around. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I would tell her all the time, like, listen, they're not bad kids. They don't do bad things. You know, like they came from really great families. They were, you know, they all got really good grades in school. The only thing that they would do after school is just to invite me to hang out at their house or, you know, have dinner with their family and things like that. And she would just view it as, oh, you know, you're, you know, creating such a huge sin. You know, those are disgusting people. They're not people of God. And she, you know, she made it seem like they were the most evil things on the planet. Mm -hmm. And it just, it it made high school very, very difficult for me because she made it known to everybody in my high school that I came from a Jehovah's Witness family and that if they would even try to get near me, you know, it would freak them out. So you mentioned that the people that you went to school with, you're still friends with them today. So do you feel that was a wise choice to do to make those friends? Oh, I I really do. I really do because they're, I I feel like they became lifelong friends for me. You know, they, you know, they, they know my husband, they know my son. We stay in contact all the time. We have each other on almost every social media you can think of. And we still keep in contact to this day. They're very, very good friends of mine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm I'm glad that I continue to stay friends with them because if not, I wouldn't have been able to get through as many obstacles as I would have without them because they were always there for me. And so they're like unconditional friends. So like the people that you were friends with at the Kingdom Hall, you can't talk to them anymore because you're no longer going. No, And and that was another thing that I tried to explain to my grandmother. I would try to be friends with some of the kids that were in the Kingdom Hall, but, you know, a lot of them had their little cliques. And if you weren't a part of that clique, you were not considered cool. You know, like they would not pay any attention to you whatsoever. And then the funny thing is I would try to, you know, a lot of these kids at the Kingdom Hall, I would see them outside of the Kingdom Hall in school and whatnot. And they were living double lives. While they were in the Kingdom Hall, they were praised by the elders and everybody in the congregation for being so spiritually strong. But then outside of the Kingdom Hall, you know, they were having sex and drinking and smoking weed and skipping class and doing things like that. And, you know, nobody in the congregation knew about that. And Mm -hmm. I I would try to bring this up to my grandmother's attention and she would never believe me. And I'm just like, you know, like I'm seeing these things for myself. It's funny because I would never do those type of things, but yet they were doing it. And yet they were considered so spiritually strong in the congregation. And I tried to bring this to light to her. And to this day, a lot of people in the congregation still don't know what half of those kids were doing. So at the Kingdom Hall, they snubbed you. And then they were doing everything they were big enough to do at school. Basically, you know, there's an elder currently in the congregation right now. And he has a daughter who is currently 19 years old. But she got pulled out of high school by her parents because she requested it. Her father's an elder. Her mother was very strict with her in terms of the religion. She was only allowed to be friends with other kids in the congregation. And she made a mistake of having sexual relations with a boy from her school. And the elder and his wife decided to keep that hush-hush. They kept it on the low because they were more worried about their reputation in the congregation and with the father being an elder than to bringing to light the mistakes that their daughter has done. She requested to be homeschooled by her parents because after she had sexual relations with this boy from her school, a lot of kids in her school, I mean, you you know how kids are nowadays. They began to call Mm -hmm. her every name in the book to say, you know, to put it in a nice way. And because of that, she wanted to be homeschooled and her parents knew what was going on and they decided to keep it on the hush hush. And the only reason I know about it and my family knows about it is because we're family with those people. Oh, I mean, distant relatives, but, you know, we've always considered each other family. You know, she needed a couple sisters, you know, to confide in about what was going on. And she told my mother about it. And, you know, my mother basically told her, well, you know, you guys have to bring this to light. I understand your husband is an elder, but you have to say something. And she basically told my mother, no, you know, he's an elder. You know, we have a very good reputation in the congregation. I don't want to bring this up and ruin what our family has done and shown for the past few years. What is your current standing in the organization? Are you disassociated? You faded? You disfellowshipped? No, no, no. I never, ever, ever was baptized. Okay. I was very close to becoming baptized. I got as far as speaking to the elders about it. But something inside me 
told me not to do it. Okay. Just told me just wait a little longer and don't do it. Just wait. And I'm glad that I did. And see, and that's the know, reason why your aunt can use that to still speak to you because you didn't get baptized. Because you know sometimes your family members, even though they know that you never got baptized, they will shun you. Because I've talked to a lot mm-hmm. of people in that in that situation. Unfortunately, that's the situation that's going on with my uncle right now. You know, God bless his soul. I love him dearly, but unfortunately, he's going through a really bad situation right now because he's a he knows for a fact that they're going to shun him because he was baptized. Does your uncle know that this is not the truth? Yeah, he he knows. We all know that it's not the truth. They can walk around screaming and yelling to the top of their lungs that it's the truth and no, it it's it's not the truth. We we know that it's not. Now, what did you do to find out that this is not the truth? What what, what kind of research have you done? Well, I started off with basically trying to find the origin, the beginning of how the Jehovah's Witnesses began. And I started to find out about all of the false prophecies where they would basically say the world is going to end on this date or it's going to end on this one and it's going to end on this one and nothing ever happened. And now it's gotten to the point that these people are following the governing body, but they're just regular everyday men. You know, there's nothing special about them at all. There is no way in hell that they are speaking to God. And, you know, Jehovah God is giving them all these rules to give to the Jehovah's Witness followers. That's like the biggest lie I've ever heard in my life. And then I've also heard about all of the child molestation scandals. And I've heard about how during conventions and, you know, in the Kingdom Hall where all these Jehovah's Witnesses would donate all their money to the organization and the governing body is rebanking all of it. And, you know, I also heard about when they were at one point associated with the United Nations. And these are all things that would basically have me sitting down and thinking to myself, like, and they swear that they're the truth. Like, they're doing mm-hmm. all these things, and they, they're swearing up and down that they're, like, the truth, and they're the best religion ever. What advice would you give to a school-aged person or maybe just a person that's just recently graduating from high school? What type of advice would you give them if they're living at home and they're feeling trapped? You may be at a young age where you probably cannot go out and live on your own, but as soon as you're able to, get out. As long as you know that it's not the truth and you feel in your heart that this is not for you, then let it be known. Because a lot of kids nowadays, you know, unfortunately they get born into it or they're sucked into it by their guardians or their parents and they feel like they have no choice. There is a way out. My way out was me going to college. My grandmother never wanted me to go to college because at the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't pursue higher education. And she never wanted me to go to college. She didn't want me to do anything with myself. She just basically wanted me to just stay in the house and marry a Jehovah's Witness and become a Bethelite and things of that sort. And my way out was I basically told her, no, you cannot stop me from going to college. You cannot stop me from pursuing a higher education. There's so much that I want to succeed in my life, and I'm going to do it. And I basically went off to a college where I was able to dorm and I was able to get out of the house and finally experience life for myself. You know, there's always a way out. Parents and guardians may try to force it upon you, but at the end of the day, you have a mind of your own. You can make your own decisions if you know in your heart that that's not for you. You said you went to school on campus? Mm Mm-hmm. I dormed, yep. Okay, so let me ask you this, you know, for our listening audience. I remember when I was coming along and they told me, oh, you can't go to college. And well, they didn't mm-hmm. say I couldn't go, but they tried to make you afraid to go because, oh, there's going to be full of drugs on campus. It's going to be all these oh, worldly yes. people. I remember what, my what was your experience used to give like? me that spiel all the time. She'd be like, oh, you, you know, I've, I've heard of girls getting raped on campus. You know, they can slip little drugs into your drink and they can hurt you or kill you or rape you. She would basically try to scare the crap out of me and feed me all these crazy, crazy, crazy stories of all the terrible things that can happen to me. And at first, it did startle me a little bit. I'm like, well, you know, that, that is true. I've heard of, you know, these types of little stories happening. But I still went anyway. And I'm glad that I did because college was the best time of my life. I had the best roommate ever where to which we got along perfect. We were both very clean people and we both enjoyed cooking. I made amazing, amazing friends. Once I turned 21, I was able to go to different bars and different clubs out there and actually feel what it's like to have fun with your friends and just go out dancing. And, you know, I I had such a great time in college, but I also went about it the smart way. 
my grandmother may have tried to scare me as much as she can, but she didn't raise no fool. And, you know, because I'm from a rough neighborhood, I, w- I was very street smart. And I knew when a situation in college was, you know, going to turn out bad or if somebody was trying to do something wrong, I was able to catch on to it and basically say to myself, nah, I'm good. I'll leave. You know, like, Mm. fortunately for me, for me, I mean, everybody's experience with college is different. But for me, it was amazing. Best time ever. And you know what? I think it's key what you said about being street smart. Because you know what? When you're a Jehovah's Witness, they try to shield you and shelter you so much that Mm -hmm. you don't know what's going on in the world. You are kind of maybe a little bit more slow than the average person because you're not exposed to a lot of things. And so, like you're saying, for people who are listening to this program and you want to go to college, you can be street smart too, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be trusting to everything. You don't have to go along with everybody just to fit in. And I think that's what happened to a lot of people who uh, were going to school and they left the witnesses. They would get in trouble with people because they wanted to fit in and they just went with any crowd. They didn't use judgment. They didn't use their common sense that they were born with, so to speak. And they did get in trouble. And the society Mm -hmm. tried to use them as an example to scare other young people away from going and pursuing their dreams. But I think what you said was very key is that you knew you understood that, and that's why mm-hmm. you didn't get in trouble. And, that, and, and that's another piece of advice that I would like to give to these young ones that are listening and tuning into your channel. You know, they may try to scare you. I know even if you're not street smart and you're not exposed to certain things that you can be able to learn from and know that those ta- you know, certain situations can get you into trouble or can get you hurt, just always try to use your common sense and just always know that if you feel in your gut that a certain situation is wrong, or that it could potentially get you hurt or get to get you into trouble. Follow your gut instincts and know that what the situation that's going on is wrong. You know, you can make the best of any situation, but you just happen to come across something where you don't feel it's right. Go with your gut feeling because, mm-hmm. you know, I have seen a lot of kids that they would make certain mistakes because they didn't know any better. Their Jehovah's Witness parents would shelter them and try to keep them locked in and never expose them to certain things that would go on in the world. But, you know, when your parents are not around, do your research. You know, in this day and age with the amount of technology that we have, do your research, you know, check into things that you want to check into and just, you know, try to make sure that if you ever are to stray away from that, you know, that religion, just make sure that you're going about it the smart way. I think so, too. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I have an individual that contacted me, and they're still living at home. And to the point where the parents were ready to kick him out of the house because they found out that he no longer wanted to go to the kingdom hall. And so he had to turn his situation around because, you know, he didn't have any place to go. And mind you, he's no longer a minor child. So Mm -hmm. he finally had to turun his situation around to make them think that he still was interested in going to the meetings so that he could still have a place to stay. So he's in the process of getting himself together so that he can get out of the home. It's very sad and it's very unfortunate. And this is why Mm -hmm. I did it the smart way. And I basically said to myself, okay, so if I don't have enough money right now to get my own place and do my own thing, then I'm going to pursue higher education. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to dorm in the school. That way I have a place to live while I'm pursuing higher education. And then when I do graduate, I have a degree to back me up so that I can be able to have a good career and be able to have my own place and, you know, be able to pay my own bills because I I I paved the way for myself to do that. Mm hmm. That's definitely smart. Mm hmm. And I think that that's probably the biggest thing for for children today is the fear factor in leaving home, the fear Mm -hmm. factor in pursuing education. And there's a lot of smart children out there and they score high in their SATs. Mm -hmm. But of course, a lot of people may not have money to go and they don't know how to find the funds to go. And in some cases, your parents have to sign off on you to even enter in to college or to sign up for financial aid and stuff like that. Yeah, and another good piece of advice to that is, you know, if they if there are some young ones out there that do have really good friends with good family backgrounds that they can rely on, count on them as well. You know, there's so many good people out there, it's unbelievable. Yeah, the world can be a messed up place and the Jehovah's Witnesses can make it seem to these young ones that literally every single person you come in contact with is like the biggest sinner ever. But at the end of the day, there are many good people out there. Absolutely. You know what? I just had a conversation with a lady. She left the organization and she's being shunned by her family and her child 
was going to school. And at one point, they're not celebrating the holidays. And so now she's letting him celebrate the holidays. So the teacher was getting kind of confused with him and her class because she didn't know if he was a witness. One day he's not celebrating the holidays and birthdays. Now he is. And so Mm -hmm. I told her, I said, you cannot assume that his teacher understands that you're no longer practicing as a Jehovah's Witness just because you're allowing him to do holidays and stuff. So I Mm -hmm. encouraged her to talk to the teacher, to let the teacher know her situation and about how they're being shunned by the members in the congregation and their family and so forth. So I heard back from her two days ago. And she told me that she is receiving an outpouring of love from the teacher and the kids in the classroom. And her son is getting ready to go in for surgery. And they all sent him a big card and they all signed it Uh and different stuff like that, you know, and gave him a, a big gift and stuff. So for those of you who are listening to this program and you have children in school and you haven't reached out to the teachers, let them know. The school counselors, let them know mm-hmm. you're being shunned by your family so that they can yeah. pitch in and give you the support that you need. That's and, another good thing about this day in education. There are so many good teachers out there and good counselors and great professors that really do care for their students deeply. And, you mm-hmm. know, if you let them know that you have things like that going on, they will be there for you. They will support you and they will help you. They're a really great support system. That's true. A lot of people, when they hear um, people that are shunning their family, they just can't believe it. Yeah, my husband, he thinks that that is like the craziest thing he has ever, ever heard. It, to them, it's shocking. They're just like, really? You know, you can cut off your own family? You know, how, how do people have the heart to do that? You know, these can be your, your children, your grandchildren, your brother, your sister, and blood relatives, and you're, you're cutting them off just because of your religion? You mm-hmm. know, a lot of people, they, they just, it's, it's shocking to them. It is. And you know what the other thing is? I had a lady contact me because she said that she was trying to get reinstated because she wanted to talk to her mother. And she was telling me that she, the brothers would not reinstate her. They said she had not been out long enough and she had been out for three years. And so she said, I went on the internet to do research on how other people were getting reinstated. And she said she ran across our videos on YouTube by mistake. And so now she's at a crossroads in her life because You know, she was a walkaway believer, and she didn't realize that this was not the truth. And so just Mm -hmm. in her search trying to be reinstated, she stumbled on the truth about the truth, and now she's on her way back out of the organization. So it's amazing um, how Mm -hmm. people are getting information in this day and age. I'm very happy that that's happening because so many people out there need to know the truth. I remember telling my mother about a couple videos that I have found on YouTube. And, you know, I was telling her about the origin of the Jehovah's Witnesses and how they were at one point tied to the United Nations. And she would sit there and be like, wow, is this for real? I'm like, I promise you I'm not lying. I will send you the links to everything right now. And a couple of the videos that I had looked up actually had actual documents in plain black and white showing them in their in the videos like you know they at one point were tied with the united nations and this is the official truth on their origin and how they had so many false prophecies and my mother you know she did believe it you know she was like why i had no idea about that and i have not remember sending her all these links but again she's too scared to leave the organization because of her mother she lives with her mother her mother takes care of her you know she takes care of her mother and my grandmother is all she has right now since i'm currently away from her so she's afraid that if she gets out, she's going to lose all of that. Yeah. You know, she she feels like she has no sense of living in this world anymore. And it's, you know, that's how I felt when I was, you know, a teenager growing up in my grandmother's house. And I keep telling my mother all the time, you know, every, you know, I speak to her literally every single day. And I would tell her, listen, you know, you're literally the best person I've ever known in the entire world. You know, I, I, I don't want you to feel that way because, you know, you, you are worth something. You're, you're the best thing ever to me in my life besides my, my husband and my son. But it's just it, it's difficult trying to explain these things to her when I'm all the way on the other side of the country. And she has my grandmother sitting there right next to her controlling her. Did she always live with your grandmother? No, no, she did not. So how did she come to be up under the control of your grandmother like that? Once my mother had officially divorced my father, you know, she, my mother married young. She never got an education. She was a high school dropout. She depended on my father for everything. 
once my mother and my father got a divorce, you know, my mother had nowhere else to go. So, of course, my grandmother took her in and she took care of her and she took care of me because I was a little girl at the time. And ever since then, she just started controlling my mother. You know, she basically said, like, if you want to live in this house, you want a place to live, you have to do as I say. This is my house. And from then Uh-oh. on, she was just able to control her. And she never moved on from there? No, never did. I really like the fact that you are your own person. You realize that you didn't want no one else telling you how to live your life because you do have dreams and goals of your own. And you realize that, you know, the watchtower is not the truth. And um, I think you're going to do very well in your relationship. And, you know, it sounds like you have a wonderful relationship. I mean, based on what we talked about before, that you and your husband are doing very well. I have a wonderful, wonderful marriage with my husband. It's crazy because my grandmother, you know, and and even my aunt at at times as well would tell me that men in the world are nothing compared to the men that are in the truth, you know, that they would cheat on you or, you know, treat you bad or whatever. And I used to stand there and just be like, well, it's funny because my husband has never once placed a finger on me. He's never once disrespected me. He's never once even cheated on me, let alone even flirt with another woman. Like I have no issues with my husband in terms of that at all. But yet I've lost count of how many men that are in the truth that are baptized Jehovah's Witnesses and that have been in the organization for years and even elders at times that would beat their wives, control their wives, belittle their wives and treat their wives like their wives, you know, their wives didn't even matter. Like they just were, they were just there. And there were so many accounts of these men cheating on their wives as well. Oh, but they're men of the truth, right? You know, and I would just try to compare them like, well, look at my marriage and look at theirs. My marriage is perfect compared to theirs. And, they, right. they, you know, and it's, it's, it's crazy. That's true. And I think, I I can't tell you the number of ladies I spoke to this week that talked about that very thing, about Mm -hmm. how they have found love, and the love that they have found has nothing to do with being a Jehovah's Witness. It's it's just so untrue that the Mm -hmm. only good men out there are at the Kingdom Hall. And so it's really sad because there's not that many brothers to begin with. And so yeah. then you, you're stuck picking these brothers that's left over. That, and they're you basically know, they're not settling. Really, yeah. And yeah, they're settling for something that they really don't want. And then on top of it, they're not treating them right. And then they go out and they find somebody out here that they call being in the world. And they're the best thing since sliced bread. You know, yeah. my father was a Jehovah's Witness as well. And he beat on my mom. He cheated on her. These are the reasons why my mother left him. And, you know, my oh, your dad was a Jehovah's Witness, too. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Where, where, where's my, your dad my, at now? Somewhere in Connecticut. I don't know. I don't speak to him. We don't talk. Is he still you a know, witness? He, no, he's no, he's not anymore. But, you know, when I was a kid and he was married to my mother, he was a Jehovah's Witness and he used to beat my mother. He was an alcoholic. He used to beat her and, you know, cheat on her on a daily basis. And my grandfather did the same thing to my grandmother. They're no longer married right now. But when they used to be married and he was very active in the Kingdom Hall and he was a Jehovah's Witness, you know, he still is to this day. You know, he was the this fellowship at one point because he used to cheat on my grandmother and, uh, you know, and, and abuse her physically and mentally. And he used to be on my on my aunts and uncles as well. And these were men that were for years serving, you know, in the Kingdom Hall. Mm-hmm. But yet here I am married to a worldly man who has never been a part of that religion. And he is one of the best men that I have ever known in my life. And that's that's a good thing. And I'm happy that many women that I'm talking to are able to to tell that story. Because every time I talk to somebody in the congregation about somebody marrying outside of the organization, they always marched these bad examples and experiences mm-hmm. in my face. And they said, look what happened to her. She married this man that wasn't a witness, and now he's on drugs, and now he's beating her, and now she's running for her life. There are bad mm-hmm. men out there regardless of the religion at all. Mm-hmm. Nobody in this world is perfect. doesn't matter if you're a Jehovah's Witness or, you know, or a, a Christian or an atheist. It doesn't matter. There are bad people out there no matter where you go, no matter where you are. And they, the bad thing about the Jehovah's Witnesses is that they make it seem that that only happens in the world. It never happens with them because, because since they're Jehovah's Witnesses, they're perfect. You know, mm-hmm. they, that, that's how they make it seem. And it's not that way at all. I think the, what makes it so dangerous being in the organization is because they feel that this brother is a witness. It's an automatic rubber stamp that he's a good person. And mm-hmm. then they really don't try to vet him out to find out really who he is because all we know is he got baptized and now he's a brother. And so now he's certified to be my husband. And we don't check it out any further than that. And then later on, people find out, oh, I'm married to a lunatic, you know? Mm-hmm. And so then you find that some people just come into the organization just because they want to find a woman because I've, yeah. I've heard of that where people are like oh this is a lot of women at the kingdom hall yeah 
And so now they act like they want to be a brother, and then they come in there, and next thing you know, there's some lunatic, and they're trying to figure out how they got there into this relationship, mm-hmm. you know? So it can be, it can be yeah. very challenging. Yeah. I think that you have shared some very, very interesting points with our audience. I mean, you know what you want. You mm-hmm. know what you were trying to attain in your life. You sound confident. If, I mean, I, we never talked about, you know, whether you had a self-esteem problem or not. But in oh, talking I did. To you, I did when I was did? a teenager. But if, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. You know, I basically okay. went through what my mother went through, it, well, what she's going through right now. I had very okay. low self-esteem, but I have huge confidence right now. I'm living, breathing proof that you can get out of that organization. You know, you can find true, actual happiness. You know, I'm happily married. I have a beautiful home. I have a beautiful little boy that my husband and I had together. And now my husband and I are both serving our country. You know, we're, mm-hmm. I'm at a very, very good place in my life right now. And I, I, I couldn't be happier. And that's excellent. And I think that's what that's what our listeners want to hear, because I find that when I go on the Internet and I listen to a lot of people's stories, they tell their story. And I think it's a great thing that they're telling their story. But I like to hear the learning outcome after they've gone through everything in their lives. Mm-hmm. That's what um, my interviews on, on my program are really about individuals who have empowered themselves. And I really feel that way about you, that you have empowered yourself and you've also been able to, you know, talk to the audience here that's listening to this program so that they too can empower themselves. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing your story. And, um, you know, we look forward to hearing more about your progress and congratulations on, you know, moving to the West Coast and getting yourself in the military. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm 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 glad that I was able to tell my story to someone. I haven't I haven't spoken to anybody about, you know, what has happened in my life since forever. I only person I've ever spoken to about it was my actual husband. I I I've definitely come a long, long way and I'm I'm really, really happy right now. So this yeah. is a good way to, to get something off your chest as well. Of course, definitely, because you know, we, we all need closure and even though I was able to get some type of closure, you know, you know, being able to live happy in my life is it, it felt pretty good to be able to talk about it and, you know, get get a little more stuff off my chest and then knowing that it could potentially help, you know, other people out there that, that have gone through the same thing that I had gone through or if they're still, you know, currently going through it, just knowing that I can be able to help in some kind of way, it definitely, you know, makes me happy. Absolutely. Okay, then. Well, thanks a lot, and I appreciate your time. All Have right. a good one, girl. Thank you so much. I'll you be in touch. Bye-bye. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you've been in the struggle and want to appear as a guest on our show, email us at exjwct at gmail.com. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of critical thinkers.